it's hardly controversial to claim that higher education is in crisis. From budget deficits to the reliance on adjunct labor, from anxieties about woke campus politics to worries about cancel culture, from the erosion of faculty governance to the empowerment of consultants and trustees, the university as an institution is being transformed. This project, of which you are now a part, seeks to make sense of these battles and changes while outlining prospects for a salutary collective future. And with that in mind, it's a pleasure to introduce Bob Meister this afternoon, evening really. Uh, Robert Meister is prof Professor of Social and Political Thought in the History of Consciousness Department at the University of California at Santa Cruz. He has also been a visiting research scholar at 3CT. In seminars, workshops, and in the lecture hall on this campus, Bob Meister's discussions of neoliberalism specificities and of capitalism more generally, of the ways in which the optionality form displaces the commodity form as a new mode of self-valorizing value, and of the problematic politics of transitional justice, to name just a few themes, have animated intellectual life and unsettled existing assumptions. Professor Meister's book, After Evil, A Politics of Human Rights, Columbia University Press, 2011, has even been the sole subject of an undergraduate seminar here. The book uh, around which you know, it was a very popular seminar uh, uh, was taught here several, I mean, many years ago now, and After Evil deserves such concerted attention because it has fundamentally transformed the ways in which many of us understand human rights discourses as well as questions of temporality, both historically and theoretically. Meister is also the author of the recent tour de force, Justice is an Option, a Democratic Theory of Finance for the 21st Century, University of Chicago Press, 2021. And Bob was kind enough to participate in a celebratory book salon, which discussed that work at length. All of his research is concerned with the moral relations between the beneficiaries of social and political injustice and its victims. This talk comes out in part of an article for a book co-edited by Joseph Masco and myself on conspiracy slash theory. Bob's article, Confessions of an Accused Conspiracy Theorist, uh, was an article about financialization and higher education as well as about faculty complacency. It stimulated a lively email conversation, largely between Joe and Bob, and it led to this invitation today. So thank you, Bob, for joining us. Before getting started, I want to thank 3CT's Associate Director, Anna Searle Jones, for her help in organizing this gathering and for everything she does to make 3CT flourish. We at 3CT are also indebted to Ryan Eckhold and two student assistants, Heather Welty and Delaney Wallace. I'm Lisa Wedeen, the director of 3CT. Welcome today, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Bob Meister. Well, Thank you, Lisa. I want to thank 3CT, especially Lisa and Joe, and also, of course, Anna. And I want to thank Professor Ando, whom I don't know and who may or may not be here, uh, for kicking off this series and, and making what I have to say about the privatization of a major public university completely relevant to what is going on at the University of Chicago which is an always private university. I was able to read his notes, if not to hear his talk, and I think anyone who read those notes or was at the talk can no longer think of your academic administrators as rational utilitarians seeking to deliver a high quality educational product at a lower cost without sacrificing too much in quality. This assumption about administrators has allowed us as faculty members to habitually deplore a world in which education and research is governed uh, by bean counters, while at the same time responding to the bean counting by uh, publicly stressing the, the benefits associated with the costs that they propose to cut. 
But if administrators, your administrators here and mine in California, are utilitarians, they are doing a bad job. That much is clear. The question is, what if, and this is the topic of Professor Ando's talk, they are not utilitarians. In which case, the criticism of what they're doing is not that it's a bad job of cutting costs while preserving educational and research quality. It's that they're really doing something else, something completely different, which is managing a portfolio of assets in which their educational brand is a source of funding liquidity and thus of potential credit creation uh, and in which the benefits of this credit creation are, is, is based on calculating according to the logic of finance, which is not based on declining marginal utility which would obviously favor funding areas in which the university is underinvested, but rather based on the logic of financialization in which the rising price of something makes it all the more investable, in which quality is reduced to ordinality or ranking, and in which the greatest incentive is to inv make the least investment that will cross the gap and give you the largest jump in ranks or ranking. That is the logic of financial administration as portfolio management rather than cost-benefit analysis based on declining marginal utility. So the argument that I want to make today is really an extension of what you heard last time from Professor Ando it is that as higher educational services becomes a cheaping, cheapening commodity that for profits can deliver in person and increasingly online, the strategy of elite nonprofit educational institutions has been to respond to this by assetizing their rankings or their brands so as to raise the price that they can charge while at the same time continuing to take advantage of the commoditization of higher education to lower the cost of what they deliver. That is the logic that is, I think, underpinning what you heard from Professor Ando last time. And in that case, what they are doing is saying that the value of higher education is less a matter of the quality of the service or instruction that they provide, and certainly less a matter of the quality of what students are able to learn and subsequently produce, and more a matter of an option embedded in the credential itself, which is a kind of hedge, a kind of downside protection against falling further behind at a, at a time, at a moment in history, where instead of upward mobility and income divergence, what people are expecting and experiencing is downward mobility and greater income and wealth divergence. It's an argument that is interesting. It's an argument that is temporally specific. The University of California embarked on these policies while I was, a mem while I was the chair and, and, and an officer of the uh, campus and, 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 and system-wide budget and planning committee at precisely the moment that it appeared, that it appeared that all of the income growth in California was in the top 20 percent of the income spectrum, which roughly corresponded to the constituency uh, of the California Higher Education Master Plan. And by the time it was implemented, the period that I'm going to talk about today, it turned out that almost all of the income growth was in the top 1% of the population. 
But the University of California began to financialize when it stopped saying that it was a force for greater economic convergence in a Keynesian economy that was defense driven uh, and uh, that uh, was based on cost plus contracts in factories in which the workers were willing to pay, pay higher taxes to qualify their children for management jobs that paid less and less of a difference from factory jobs to a world in which we had tech uh, and we had tech-based finance. And it was assumed, it was assumed that if tech was the driver of inequality, then income inequality was the result of, 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 of an education premium and that the university, instead of being a driver of income convergence, was a driver of income divergence. Instead of being a source of upward mobility, it was a hedge against downward mobility. So what we have in the financialized system of higher education administration explains why, as Professor Ando observed, resources go to areas that are rising in rank because they are already being funded. Resources are cut in areas that won't rise in rank, even if they are funded, because the resources will go to meet unmet needs, like at my campus teaching Shakespeare and Dostoevsky in the literature department, which any literature department should do. And you will have a situation where, as Professor Ando observed, some campuses, particularly those with non-academic industrial partnerships, are allowed to run cumulative budget deficits. We call them negative carry forwards because other units are expected to underspend the money that is appropriate to them and run permanent positive carry forwards, which they will never be permitted to expend or draw down. All of this is stuff that Professor Ando illustrated here at the University of California. And I spent 15 or 20 years, much of my 50s and 60s, I'm sorry, at the University of Chicago, and I spent much of a 20 year period during my 50s and 60s trying to expose similar problems at the University of California. The key takeaway from this talk and the one you just heard is that commoditization of educational services and the financialization of educational credentials are distinct processes that operate in tandem, but that nevertheless lead to distinct critiques. Financialization is what explains how elite universities, both public and private, can successfully charge more in an area when the commoditization of higher education would otherwise require them to charge less. Indeed, it explains how in an era where under Zoom conditions, the marginal cost of delivering our courses was close to zero, the price of tuition continued to rise, and students continued to pay it. They were paying for the embedded asset in the degree, the option or hedge, rather than the quality of the service and the marginal cost of providing it. Now, the brand itself, which justifies the price of higher education as an asset, when its cost as a commodity is approaching zero, this is the problem. And the brand itself depends upon the fact that there are tenured faculty, like me, like you, who have the academic freedom to say that this is no longer what it once was, that it's no longer good that it's no longer of University of California or University of Chicago quality as we knew it, and that we don't say that. We decline to say that. 
it wouldn't take much faculty dissent, if that dissent is made public, to subvert an acidization strategy that depends almost entirely on our willingness to cover for it by asserting or not denying that the quality remains approximately the same. Or at least this is what I thought from about 2000 to about 2015, or actually 1995 to 2015, when I tried to leverage a position that I put myself in as chair of the most important budgetary committee, and chair is waiting until I was vetoed of the most important system-wide budget committee for the academic senate, at the same time that I was president of the labor union of tenure and tenure track faculty for the University of California system as a whole. I spent my time trying to leverage the connection between those two positions, which entitled me to all university financial documents in my Senate capacity, which were intrinsically public documents that I was free to release without Senate sanctions in my union capacity, so as to simultaneously expose, discredit, and eventually resist what the university was trying to do in a way that refused to simply echo the university's administration, the university administration's complaint that it was only forced to make these changes because of declining state support. No, I was saying, the documents revealed that UC's leaders really want to do what they will blame on the state, that they would do it anyway, and that they plan to do it anyway and to blame it on the state. Okay? In other words, the truth is that they are in a different business than they were when education created opportunities for upward mobility in an age of income and wealth compression. Now the question is whether they can charge more by providing opportunities perhaps for lateral mobility and a hedge against downward mobility in an era of income and wealth divergence. Now, I want to talk about what happened and then how the faculty reacted to it. By the time this policy of financialization actually took effect, we were 10 years beyond the point where all income growth occurred in the top 20%. We were at the point where all income growth was occurring in the top 1%, at least in California. And in 2009, at the height of the global financial crisis, I wrote an open letter to UC students published over my name as union president, telling them that five years earlier, the University of California as approved by the Budget Committee on which I sat, hatched a plan to borrow what would in effect be an endowment of $15 billion from the Wall Street bond market in order to diversify out of the higher education business, which was its public mission, into healthcare, tech partners, partnerships, real estate development, and so forth. It was important that these were different UC bonds than those that had been traditionally issued to cover the costs of things that the state would not fund, parking, student housing, and so on and so forth, and that were to be funded by the, by the revenues generated by the projects themselves. These were rather general revenue bonds, as they were called that were to be paid by pledging all revenues from the, of the university that did not come from taxes, and in which the fastest, the largest and fastest growing component was enrollment generated revenues, that is to say, revenues from, on the one hand, enrollment growth, 
and on the other hand, tuition increases. So the university's plan was to increase enrollment-generated revenue by three to four times over an eight-year period. They were going to do this first by increasing undergraduate enrollments by 40% without commensurate state support. This was the equivalent of building essentially two or three new campuses without paying for two or three new campuses, simply paying the cost for each student of adding one student to each existing campus. And then the goal with a 40% larger enrollment was to double and triple tuition with a discount that would lead to enrollment generated revenues increasing by about 50%, a number that allowed the university to borrow, to collateralize construction bonds that would be funded by the private sector rather than the state. In other words, the plan after increasing enrollments by 40% was to increase tuition from about six or seven thousand dollars to about thirty thousand dollars by 2015. That was the plan. I know it. I had the documents. Now you might think this sounds okay, or at least reasonable, if that what it if, that, if that's what it would take to restore the budgetary quality of instruction under higher enrollments to what it was under lower enrollments. But the UC's plan was not to do that. Its plan was to make the budgetary quality of instruction essentially, as I calculated it, 35% worse and to do it by design. By first telling students that the cuts were justified because, this, because the state was not paying for enrollments, that the tuition increases were justified by the cuts, but not telling students that the increased tuition was not going to be used to reverse the cuts. Because unlike the state funding that was supposedly missing, tuition was an unrestricted source of revenue that, and here was my teaching moment, was essentially capital in the sense that it could be assetized and if it was assetized, securitized, and if it was securitized, essentially financed. Financed. So the idea was to make UC worse by design in terms of expenditure per credit hour, and then to justify the tuition increases, and then not to spend the tuition increases to restore the cuts that were used to justify them. And as a result, what felt to UC students like an inf inflationary increase in the price they were paying for their education was actually transformed by UC's policy into an appreciation in the value of its total portfolio by the expansion of its balance sheet into real estate investments, off-budget public-private partnerships, and so on and so forth football teams financed by sports betting so that they could pay athletes' salaries and eventually withdraw from the Pac-10 and join the Big Ten. This is what was going on. This is what was going on. And it was all done by pledging what was essentially a 40 or 50 percent increase in general revenue, all of which was due to the ability to increase both enrollments and tuition collected off those enrollments. What I'm saying is that the University of California had every incentive to replace state dollars, which were restricted funds, with tuition dollars, which were capital, cash flow that could be capitalized, as long as the state, under then Governor Schwarzenegger, would allow it to do so because tuition could essentially be securitized in a way that state funding could not. Now, I didn't make this up. It was in the bond indentures that I was able to obtain 
and that I posted online. You see, promised the bond markets that it would raise tuition when times were bad by approximately as much as it then said in 2009 it had been forced to do because of state budget cuts. It promised the bond markets that it could blame state budget cuts in order to do this. And at the same time, it said that it could raise tuition an equivalent amount when the economy was good and income disparities were rising by claiming that income disparities were rising because of the premium accruing to higher education as an asset class rather than the cost of delivering it as a commoditized service. It was all there in the financial documents. It was all there to prove that they were telling bond dealers that elite public higher education was in a position to raise prices, increase demand, and lower quality at the same time in the way that defies the logic of commodity markets, but that replicates the logic of asset markets. What was not in the doc documents was that you see also understood, and this was clear to me sitting on the budget committee and having access to everything the budget committee was allowed to see, that UC's aim here was to take advantage of a window of opportunity to diversify its revenue base away from higher, higher education during the 10-year period in which the university was essentially uh, going to be able to bring about a 40% increase, 50% increase in its tuition revenue. The scheme, in other words, which was going to close and expected to close within a decade or two, was that this would be a period in which many students would be borrowing for increased tuition at 6 to 12% at the federally guaranteed rate to finance UC's ability to borrow to diversify its revenue base at 2 to 3 percent. In other words, it was basically arbitraging the collection of collateral that, it could, uh, that students, on which students would pay a higher rate of interest so that it could pay a lower rate of interest to deliver something which was a worse product than what they were getting before, just in terms of cost per credit hour, which I agree, agree is a crude uh, amount. Moreover, the university was not disclosing that for debt burdened students, this was not a cap on their educational investment because compounding interest and negative amortization would eat up much of their expected income for the next 20 to 30 years so that for many, paying off one's higher education would be an alternative or a clawback of leveraged investments that they could make in their future home or pension. UC's potential strategy was thus to bet that potential students terrified by rising inequality and wishing lateral mobility when upward mobility was foreclosed to them, would exaggerate for at least a 10-year period the financial benefits of a higher education, at the end of which they would come to realize that the income gaps that higher education still produced were not being reinvested to create the wealth gap that borrowing for higher education no longer produced the wealth gap had been clawed back by the financial sector with which the University of California was colluding. So yes, UC was operating not like a university, my UC that is, it was operating like a hedge fund, a financial intermediary that was arbitraging the spread between two credit markets to finance the diversification of its revenue base by exploiting the student fears that it was 
indeed, intentionally creating. The conclusion of my analysis, in other words, was that the university was taking what a financial thinker would describe as a short position on student success while inducing students to take a highly leveraged and risky long position that was likely to result in their failure. What happens next is that around universities in California, the foreclosed houses were being bought up by hedge funds in which the university was investing that were increasingly converting student uh, uh, single family houses into rentals, rentals house rentals into room rentals, room rentals into bed rentals, so that by now, by now, the university student debt is essentially funding the rent burden in which the university is investing to recapture the money that students are borrowing directly uh, in that way. And I could answer questions, if you like, about the, about the wildcat strike at the University of California last year, the successful wildcat strike, uh, the leadership of which included uh, many, if not a majority, of my students. In any case, this is what happened. It was true. My analysis was correct. The students believed me. I gave speeches after which, after I was invited, students voted to occupy the building, sometimes for as long as a week, sometimes with a violent outcome. Politicians took an interest. The headline in The Nation by Ben Ehrenreich was, Ehrenreich was California scheming. And it was an article that compared UC's business plan to IMF uh, imposed structural adjustments. And I was giving talks about this in Europe, uh, uh, in Africa, uh, giving interviews and so on and so forth. Now, I hadn't accused them of conspiring to do this. I'd accused them, I simply said they were planning to do this. But and that they were planning to do it for reasons they thought justified. But when they denied not only that they had planned to do it, but that they were doing it, despite the documents that I posted, that turned it into a conspiracy, because they were now doing it and concealing it. But it also, and this is what I want to talk about next, allowed them to attack me as a conspiracy theorist, accusing them of doing something that they were denying that they were doing, and thus questioning their motives and their integrity by essentially calling them liars about their motives. And how could I know their motives when I should, in fact, uh, uh, simply uh, refer to them as, as perhaps uh, individuals experiencing an untruth rather than <laughs> <laughs> deliberate, <laughs> deliberately lying? So here's what I had. And I'm really talking to people uh, who think, uh, based on Professor Ando's talk, that similar things may be happening here. I'm not in a position to know that, but I'm not surprised if it's true. I had an analysis explaining what they were doing, and my analysis held up. I had an inside position in the Academic Senate that allowed me full access to the documents that I could use to refute their attempt to rebut my analysis. I had an outside position as president of a statewide labor union that gave me access to media and politicians without having to go through Senate channels in order to speak to media and politicians. And with these three elements, I had an ultimate plan. And the ultimate plan was to mobilize enough of the faculty to say that the university was really making itself worse by doing these things, and that it was making itself worse at the expense of its students' future. It was essentially taking a short position on student success to diversify out of the higher ed business. And the plan was based on a simple fact, that at least in the University of California, we have a system called shared governance. The bylaws of the Academic Senate make it impossible for the administration to do things and still be accredited if the faculty do not consent. In other words, it gives the faculty both the freedom, and I would argue, did argue, the duty to say this is making the university worse. Now, I had a trial run here. My chancellor, when I first became chair of the Budget Committee, 
my chancellor had already tried to take over the NASA Ames facility where the blimps used to be and run a University of California Santa Cruz degree that would be given for essentially no coursework except supervised work experience where the work experience would be supervised by Moonlighting Community College faculty. And our budget committee to this day passed a resolution blocking this and saying no plan would be approved unless the Senate could assure our students at Santa Cruz that the degree in Silicon Valley would be a UC degree of UC quality and prima facie of the same budgetary quality as a UC degree on our campus. It happened. We passed it. Working under me on the budget committee were our future chancellor and vice chancellor who supported this, but then reneged on it when they took office. But they never established an academic program or even proposed one 25 years later. It's been 25 years since this passed, but it's still draining money from the academic mission of the campus. The plan based on this experience was for the union to run candidates for the committee that appointed Senate committee members and essentially to create a faculty party, a political party within the faculty, obviously a potential minority, but a party that the conformists on the faculty would be unwilling to defy or cross by approving things that they should have alerted the faculty to before those proposals went through. Example being the Silicon Valley campus that was going to blow up, expand, balloon UC's enrollments by about 30 percent, UCSC's enrollments by about 30 percent, without providing any instruction or, or, or requiring any instruction in a regular UC course taught by a UC Senate faculty member. That was the plan. Here's what happened. That was the part of the plan, the only part of the plan that failed. And here's why, and here's my warning to you, and the thing I would, would, uh, would very much be, be interested in hearing you discuss based on your experience here. Instead of admitting that UC was doing what I showed it was doing and arguing that under the circumstances it was justified under the financial theories that I was essentially teaching <laughs> when I revealed this. <laughs> President Udoff took it upon himself to hold a press conference accusing me of accusing him of something. Accusing him of conspiring to raise tuition and to misuse the funds to pay for buildings rather than reverse cuts to the academic quality of the university. And to pay for buildings that were both outside its academic mission and that did not pay for themselves, several of which in fact were subsidizing corporate partnerships. He then contrasted me with our campus chancellor by then, who had been my former ally in stopping the Silicon Valley venture that he, he was now running, and who joined in denouncing me, while at the same time privately passing on internal data showing that not only were several UC campuses, including ours, not receiving the tuition funds that their students were paying, a few of them were not even receiving the full funding that the state was still providing, the reduction in which had justified raising tuition throughout the system. He trusted me, in other words, to leak this information and to conceal its source while denouncing me and joining in Udoff's denunciation of me as somebody who was accusing him of the conspiracy. So 
This was information that I turned over to the state legislature, which conducted an audit. I can tell you that in the questions if you want to hear more about it. But for a long time, I thought, simply, that my critique and analysis was correct and was vindicated, that its uptake by the students led to a reversal of the tuition increase increases or a freeze of the tuition increases for the better part of 10 to 12 years. But I also learned from this experience that in doing this, we had created irresistible opportunities for our closest allies, including the chancellor and the vice chancellor on the campus, to sell us out. We had essentially raised the price that a sellout could charge for doing that to the highest office of the university. And the third thing, or fourth thing I learned, was that when our colleagues and friends sold us out, those who didn't, and indeed those who wouldn't, were unwilling, completely unwilling, to criticize those who did. And it's why that happened that I want to discuss in the remainder of this talk. OK? You see where I'm going. In other words, this resistance, this reluctance to criticize colleagues who took an opportunity the situation provided to advance their career to the highest level on campus, in fact, was actually how the administration succeeded in blocking our attempt to create the last step of my strategy, which was a political, a small political party in the campus that would control Senate committees <coughs> and hold accountable members of Senate committees seeking promotion to the university who sold out the university's mission. That was the idea. Now, until recently, until Joe Masco invited me to participate in the Conspiracy Theory Conference, I just thought my paper would be on why it is that saying that people's motives are financial sounds more accusatory than saying they're simply obeying economic necessity, why finance appears more nefarious, uh, more manipulated, uh, more manipulative of the economy, more subversive of the economy, as Veblen, uh, more destabilizing of the economy, than simple invisible hand economics. And I thought, well, I was going to write a paper simply called Finance as Conspiracy, uh, uh, Economics as Theory, showing how this was so. But I happened to mention to Joe Masco, I don't see him here, but I happened to mention to Joe that I myself had been accused of doing this by the University of California administration, which claimed that instead of having a financial plan to acetize higher education, it was simply acting as anyone would have acted in response to the invisible hand of an economic crisis, and of course, trying to get more revenue any way it could. Why wasn't that a sufficient explanation? Well, I had been accusing them, you see, of something, and they relied on the willingness of my faculty, friends, and allies, the good guys in all of this, the admirable people in all of this, to be too polite to say that they were lying and too polite to accuse them of advancing their own career at the expense of the mission of the University of California, which was defined by the master plan. Well, until I actually had to think through my own experience of being called a conspiracy theorist, I was simply focused in all of these intensified encounters I had on several UC campuses uh, in which professedly well-meaning people with ambitions to rise in the administration took it upon themselves to investigate what they called my, my charges in order to determine whether indeed the administration was actually motivated to do the things I said the financial logic required them to do, or whether they, and, and, and what to do about the fact that they denied that this was their, I mean, it was just awful. I was repressing all of that. 
I was really repressing all of that because, because I was making my case, successfully making my case. I had the documents, their plans explained what happened, and it was indubitably true that these were their plans. No more to be said, I thought. I now see, however, that there were several things in our faculty culture beyond politesse, beyond etiquette, beyond the refusal to be confrontational, that actually inhibited the creation of the kind of response I hoped to make permanent by essentially entrenching the existence of labor relations law into the shared governance system of the University of California that was designed to give the faculty ultimate control over the quality of the academic mission. Several things, and I just want to list them. I have some bullet points, and then I'll open it for discussion. OK, am I, am I OK on time? The first is that we, as faculty members, are culturally allergic to any explanations that are based on specific plans and intentions, pre-existing plans and intentions of decision makers, when they can later say, ex post, that they simply did what anyone, or what everyone, in fact, did when confronted with the same situation. Why should the fact that they had a plan, in other words, be held against them when the invisible hand would be a sufficient explanation for what actually happened, regardless of their plan. And their plan might not have succeeded if what actually happened wasn't necessary, no matter what they thought. In other words, if the invisible hand or economic necessity is a sufficient explanation of what they did, why criticize, why not praise them for having anticipated a catastrophe with a plan? Resilience, after all, benefiting while others lose, is the essence of portfolio management. And it's the essence of portfolio management to create resilience by including in your portfolio lots of options that offset the effects of volatility. So again, I was put in the position of appearing to criticize them for having plans the following of which did not explain what happened, whereas in fact I was criticizing the plan itself as a plan to capitalize on a crisis in delivering their academic mission in a way that subverted their academic mission rather than raising funds to support their academic mission. It was a plan to sell what would amount to educational derivatives rather than education itself and many of these derivatives, at the time at least, were going to be MOOCs that were pegged to performance in UC courses by students from China and could be sold to students in China for whom the option of attending UC or even coming to California was foreclosed, but who could benefit from the continued recalibration of their performance in China to Chinese students in California, educational derivatives, out of the money options to get credit at UC. This is what they were doing. So my critique was of the plan. I was trapped into appearing to criticize them as having a plan and tying myself to the anti popperian position that a plan explains what happens better than a, an explanation that does, is not contingent on what people's motives were at all. Second, first, in other words, problem in our culture had to do with a sort of philosophy of social science uh, about, about, about the relevance of plans. And uh, the second was about motives. As soon as Udoff, the president of UC, denied my charge, the next accusation was that I was attacking his motives. In other words, that I was calling him a liar about what his motives were when I couldn't know, obviously, 
what his actual motives were. So this too, attacking people's motives, is something that faculty are allergic to doing culturally. It's not just etiquette. Early on, I was told by one of my junior faculty mentors, 1970s, who falsely told the EVC that my best friend in the department had finished his PhD when he hadn't. How could you do that, I said. He said, you are in a world where it would be worse to accuse me of lying than it is for me to lie. Why? Because if you accuse me of lying, you are calling me a liar and essentializing me. In other words, <laughs> it is Satan, the accuser, who is irredeemable and not the sinner he accuses. It's part of our culture, isn't it? We are certainly not willing to be accused of accusing somebody of telling us the truth or of telling something false because, uh, again, it's a matter of motives. The third point, I think, has to do with the cultural resonance of the topic of finance itself. The idea was that if I was attributing Udolf's motives or the campus motives to finance, I was somehow implying that those motives were themselves intrinsically corrupt and even manipulative in a way that simply bowing to economic necessity by needing more money and finding it where one could would not be. Veblen, finance is subversive of the market. Minsky, finance is destabilizing of the market. Economic theory is a negative feedback system in which the more something costs, the less you want it. But you are imagined to be in a Walrasian auction in which everyone is isolated and simply taking prices without, con with, without knowing what prices others take. In finance, it's a positive feedback system. Desire is mimetic. The more something costs, the more you want it until you don't. And as a result, the idea of finance is essentially something that people are prejudiced against if they believe in market equilibrium because finance disrupts or destabilizes market equilibrium or at least makes those equilibria cyclical. Now, I can't claim to be a complete innocent in all of this. When I wrote an article saying, will Wall Street save the public university, I was certainly exploiting the popular prejudice against finance, just as the university was exploiting the popular prejudice in favor of invisible hand explanations when it said, never mind what we said, we did what everyone would do, we did what anyone would do, you would have been forced to do the same thing in my position. But what needs to be said here, and again, it can't be easily said within our culture, is that acidization and commoditization are really two epistemes within economic theory or social logics that contextualize and explain the necessity or apparent necessity of an action by giving something that could alternatively be described as either what causes it if you have different motives or the reason for it if you embrace those causes. And that there is a third thing, which is how you psychologize yourself in relation to these epistemic logics. And whether you psychologize yourself by either embracing or deploring the causes that are given by the commoditization episteme or, or the acidization episteme. So it's indeed quite possible that our administrators, such as my former friend, the chancellor, actually deplored what they felt it was necessary for them to do. But the fact that they deplored it and distanced themselves from it and disavowed a desire to do it doesn't in any way detract from the fact that the episteme is what explains what they did and not the way they psychologized their disavowal of it. There's a further reason, a third reason, which 
is that the refusal to demonize or criticize those who sell us out is not just a matter of etiquette, which is that faculty who want to criticize them will often think that the criticism is not that the university is interested in its own rankings, but simply that it should be more interested in our individual rankings within our field and also the rankings of the department because these are academic rankings that bear directly on academic quality and that this is the criticism. Well, if this is the criticism, it participates directly in the logic of finance because how could you then impose a professional cost or even a negative review of academic service on a colleague who thinks that any internal criticism of the administration for becoming worse, if it hurts the campus brand, also damages the careers of colleagues and the reputations of departments and thus makes it more difficult for departments to hire and more difficult for colleagues to leave for a better department rather than a worse department. So even if there are positive synergies between one's campus career and one's disciplinary or professional career, it's very unlikely that lies and cover-ups to promote one's campus career will hurt one professionally and very likely that hurting the reputation of one's campus or one's department will be criticized by your colleagues as harming them professionally and ultimately as a consequence will harm you. I'll skip one point which is dear to my heart but let me just end with, 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 with a final point again beyond mere et etiquette is that organized faculty resistance to financial plans that sideline or organize academic quality are expressed in a certain voice which is culturally typical of the voice that Keynes described as financials, characterizing financial markets. We, when we speak in these ways, speak as though we are not saying something, but rather voicing through our mouths what is being said by others. We do not speak in our own voice. My colleague Brian Masumi shared with me a manuscript on Trump in which his example of this, it's a criticism of Trump in this book, is when Trump speaks essentially, you know, I don't know, but a lot of people are saying that. So what? Brian calls this the fourth person singular. It is the voice, <laughs> <laughs> it is the voice of the Greek chorus. Uh, in personnel meetings, in hiring meetings, in academic review meetings, we have learned not to speak in our own voice by becoming the authoritative voice of what is being said by others. So that it is perfectly appropriate, or is considered perfectly appropriate, to discuss the optics of a decision, but never appropriate to discuss the decision based on one's own judgment of the quality of the work or the program or anything else. This is, of course, to view academia itself as an internal asset market in the way that portfolio managers discuss and evaluate their investment decisions. And it is not ultimately a way to discuss and evaluate academic quality. And so, just as it's impossible to criticize administrators for not focusing only on our personal rankings and our department rankings when they make their investment, it's really not possible to question what is wrong with administrators who say that if the academic enterprise is conducted in this way, why shouldn't we also listen to the fourth person singular in discussing what people are saying about the academic enterprise itself, which is what they're actually doing. 
Now, I'm going to skip the fourth, the final point, which is controversial, which is about the, the death of campus etiquette and the establishment of not a political party of faculty, but a kind of campus religion around campus values, which has now made it all of a sudden okay to attack one's colleagues, to ostracize them, and so on and so forth, uh, under the rubric, at least on my campus, that the real change is us and that we are a community that is converted to right thinking on these questions. It isn't what I wanted. Uh, it's not a party led by a union. It's a religion sponsored by administrators. But I don't want to talk about that, although I'm happy to answer questions about it. What I have to recommend, and this is my conclusion, is quite simply that it's not enough to simply say that the things that the university should rank and invest in are our own self-rankings and our department rankings, because then you can't criticize anyone for advancing their career by thinking that their rankings depend on the campus ranking. And I'm sure this is even more true at your place than it is at my place. What we need is to find a voice to reaffirm the value of an education. And it's an ethical value in other terms than this. In ways that make clear what specific goods campus financial policies, the policies themselves and not the fact that they're financial, are willing to sacrifice if people, including a university's own faculty, still believe that people are saying that it's ranked highly, so what's the problem? I have in mind another tension, in other words, in which both corporate campus ratings and professional disciplinary ratings are on one side, and what my longtime friend and collaborator Randy Mark Martin called a kind of transdisciplinary university discourse is on the other side. This is a form of university life, a responsibility for the institution itself that very much existed when I came to UC now 50 years ago in 1973. Hannah Arendt would have called it a politics, higher education. Max Weber would have called it a vocation. As a political theorist, I'm neither a Weberian nor an Arendtian. And I am uncomfortable with the uses my colleagues sometimes make of those concepts. But maybe beginning there, and maybe beginning there in this 3CT module, is at least a way to think about repoliticizing the university in a good way, a way that gives us some distance from the, from the specific financial models that are gradually ruining the thing I have done and loved for the past 50 years. <laughs> Sorry, I went on too no, long. No, that's not the problem at all. Thank you. We have time for questions, and there's a microphone because we are recording this, you should know. Uh, I hope that's a bit uncomfortable. And uh, please uh, direct your questions to Professor Meister. And where's the? Oh, okay. Anna has. It. So, Bob, why didn't you just pick folks and? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm curious. Having gone to private undergrad, I was told a lot about financial aid, and. There was a notion that that really changed the math of what it meant that the tuition was $60,000 a year. And I know your school is different, but like, is it different because of financial aid? And where does that fit into their model to raise tuition? That's my question. So what UC says is that, there, that it is free for people whose family income is below a certain area, although it's only tuition that is not charged. It's, uh, UC is also complicit in basically turning all 
university area housing into rental housing and driving up the rents, it's a tuition discount. What this simply means is that the, uh, that the top tuition is, um, that, that, that the benefits to the university of raising enrollments and raising tuition is discounted for maybe a third of the students so that the amount of, of additional tuition they can take in from raising enrollments by 50% is maybe only a 20 or 30% increase. There will always be, at whatever the margin is, there will always be a band in which families are paying approximately 50 to 80 percent of any income above the cutoff level to the university. And what this is doing is deepening the class divide between those who don't take on debt and those who are no longer willing to take on debt because the debt they take on claws back most of their ability to turn whatever income advantages they get into wealth advantages. Uh, yes, Dara and then Andreas and then. Uh, thanks, Bob. That was a gripping story. Um, I sort of think that if they make it into a film, it might be less a thriller than a dark um, comedy. And so p the one I, was, I was depressed having to, to think about, you know, instead of being all engaged in, in proving that I was right, actually having to think about how I got enmeshed in this molasses. <laughs> yeah, but the thing that I don't really, and maybe I missed it in the course of events, but the thing that I can't quite make sense of is why they're doing it. So like part of it seems to be that they may not actually even know what they're doing, right? That they're caught up in a logic that is beyond their comprehension in a certain way. Now here the explanation of that might be that, uh, let's say, uh, very generous donors to the institution who also play an administrative role uh, over the institution might be nudging administrators in a particular direction. It's less clear in your story that that would be what's driving things. But what I can't, but it seems sometimes like they're doing it, they're, they're mimicking other institutions that do what they do to make massive returns on investments for investors. But there are no investors here. So what is the like what gets them into the logic in the first place if there's no, unless it's just like, you know, a bigger endowment is a better endowment and they're all just really caught up in a very strange attachment to the they, size of the endowment. They did it to borrow the substitute for the endowment they don't have. Now, as an accused conspiracy theorist, I could have pointed out and did not that the university's chief financial officers and about 80% of the regents are in the real estate bond investment industry and the asset management industry. And they are also partnering with the university in raising the spreads around universities such that the class premium you can collect by investing in rental conversions of non-rental properties is now between 12 and 30 percent depending on whether you are converting to rentals, to single room rentals, or to single bed rentals. These are the opportunities in Berkeley and my graduate students did a wildcat strike because the rent of a single room was $35,000 a year in Santa Cruz and their stipends were only 22. They got their stipends raised to 35, which even before taxes doesn't pay their rent. In other words, the only way that the university could have met their demands was to let everyone in the UC system both study and teach remotely from, from Riverside, which is the only place you can live in the UC system on a UC stipend. So there's a lot of money to be made. UC 
during this period, when it raised tuition, was able to finance the construction of two new medical centers that created between the airport and, 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 and the Giants ballpark, the equivalent of a biotech Silicon Valley. That's, that's, where, that's where the money is to be made. And the reason that they're doing it is because student debt financed tuition increase is a narrowing window for a diversified hedge fund to invest in but a short-term cash cow. That's the theory. Now, let me flip the argument. The implication of your question is that it isn't necessary for them to do it, and they can't do it if the faculty are willing to say that if they do it, UC will no longer be what it was and no longer, in fact, command the premium that it has. That's what I was counting on. And what I'm trying to explain is why that didn't happen. So the, I think the real impetus of your question is that it doesn't have to happen. And that's indeed the reason I wasted, or may have wasted, all those prime years of my academic life fighting these battles. Thank you. Bob, it's Mary Beth Putup from Community Studies at UCSC. Oh my god, what are you so doing here? I want to just say, um, <laughs> I, I agree with your analysis. I lived through your analysis. My program was chewed up and spat out during it. Yeah, I had, one of, I had one of those programs yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to just add a little context though. I think one of the things that that happens in the UC system is that system-wide rivalry, and I think it affects, um, you know, there's a pecking order, and I think at Santa Cruz in particular, there's a real culture of poverty. Um, I mean, we that as a campus, there's not even those assets to eliminate in order to save money, um, like medical schools, you know, sports teams, etc. Um, and I think that feeds into another kind of key process, which is the administrative bloat that t has taken place. I don't know if that's also a factor at U University of Chicago. Um, <laughs> it was, it, it, when I, but I when mean, I, you know, that when I, I was one chair, of, when one I was of my chair. colleagues, Craig yeah. Reinerman, you know, has a s standing statement about when he was hired, there was a half a page of vice chancellors, and now there's page upon page. And right. it seems to me that that administrative bloat really feeds into what you're saying about the faculty, because there's become a revolving door where faculty take administrative positions for short-term term gain to make more money. Um, and so it, there's no, to me, there, to me there's no question that the administration isn't questioned by faculty, because many faculty go from being in the faculty senate chairs to high-level administrative positions. I, I can't tell you the number of times I was told by administrators, you can say this, but we'll get even with you in the personnel process. It, well, exactly. It, and there's a kind of culture of favors. I mean, it's not just local, but because I think that administrative bloat is really across higher education. Um, the last thing I want to say, just to, you know, there is a lot of rank and file discontent. I mean, there is a, it's like living in East Germany where everybody knows what's happening but nobody feels like they can really, you know, form a East Germany. That no one, you know, among faculty, everybody can see it. No one feels like they can really do anything about it. So just. Yeah, and, uh, you know, but it, in, in, increasingly the people who would have been on our side are, are, are willing to praise the administration for embracing campus values and condone what the administration is doing otherwise. Absolutely, because there's a kind of a culture of favors, you know, like yeah. you want a favor for a center or for this or that, and so, so you, have, you don't have, bite the hand that feeds you. Have you retired, or are you like me? I, I'm actually, I voted with my feet, so I'm now, I'm now here. Anyway, that's enough about me. <laughs> well, no, nice to see you. I haven't seen you for years. Yeah, thank you. Um, this was a wonderful talk, Bob. But I have the same question that Dara has, and I'm not sure that I fully understood or 
um, believe that you have answered Dara's question about, you know, the beginning, the in initial sort of move, this transition, you know, from one way of running universities to another way of running universities. In your answer to Dara's question, you seem to suggest that a financial logic is there right from the beginning. And somehow this, this doesn't persuade me. So sort of maybe we'll just ask the same question again. Sort of they are having a set of new projects that they want to carry through. They have nothing to do with the old mission. And they're taking on debt for financing these new projects, right? So these were in part communities, sometimes these were ventures. Maybe you can specify a little bit more why they were sort of designing these projects as the future-oriented projects that the university needs to move into. Uh, in order to maintain rankings, status within the California system or beyond the California system. And then maybe um, also talk about the trustees, which is just, you know, sort of a very important component of our stories about the composition, about who is overseeing the university, who belongs to the um, group of peers in, so for the university president. I mean, we need to sort of see that a president or a chancellor, in your case, as soon as they move up, they're moving in a completely different social circle. They're not surrounded mostly by faculty anymore, but in our case, by hedge fund managers. You know, they're having dinner with them, and they're sort of beginning to absorb the logic of their thinking, um, and so on and so forth. Two components to your story. One, one, one part of your question is why they changed the educational mission. And the answer is they decided to do that when they got the 1998 legislative analyst report, which showed that the effect of California's tax revolt and the replacement of defense-driven industry with tech had concentrated all income gains in the top 20 percent and that they saw a political advantage in telling people in the top 20 percent who were part of the master plan uh, uh, base, uh, taxpayers who are being left behind by the training you're getting are no longer going to be willing to pay. And they told taxpayers, don't pay because these people are getting ahead at your expense. And they thought we can generate, they had no plan at that time, as of, as of the, the legislative analysis report, they had no plan at, at that time for making these investments. Uh, they wanted to generate discretionary revenue by essentially claiming credit for inequality rather than arguing that they were a driver of equality. And that was the original mistake. By the time we got to where I'm talking about, there were all sorts of opportunities for UC using biotech, AI, and particularly surveillance technology to generate from the private sector partnerships that yielded far greater growth potential than its educational business. They hired uh, as their president around following Yudov, Janet Napolitano, who had essentially created the homeland security industry that UC was funding. So the idea eventually was that by creating private sector partnerships north of Stanford and in Southern California, that they could participate in financing using their 2% interest borrowing power, they could not only 
replicate the lost money from the state, which was not a big deal, but they could replicate the, the defense industry's funding by, 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 by partnering with a privatized security industry. So the real opportunities, and this was the transition from Yudov to Napolitano, was leveraging the ability to partner with a privatized securities industry, security industry and a privatized biotech industry and transition out of the education business and transition out of Senate scrutiny. I was in line to be chair of the system-wide budget committee which had the power to review the renewal of UC's contract to manage the national labs during the George W. Bush administration when the competitor was Texas. Richard Blum was the owner of the Democratic counterpart to Halliburton in Texas, Cheney's company, and had the contracts to manage converting Los Alamos from a research facility into a manufacturing facility. I proposed to investigate that and potentially stop it since it passed through my committee. The person who became chancellor of our university was then chair of the academic senate and created a plebiscite process that bypassed all academic senate committees and concealed the fact that the terms of the contract would not only be not reviewable by committees, but uh, uh, not disclosable to committees. Richard Blum was the largest defense contractor who was a Democrat. He was chair and vice chair of the Board of Regents. His wife was ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee during the Iraq and Afghanistan war. And I could not get anyone to pick up these stories north of San Diego. Is that a better answer? Yeah, it's getting there. So <laughs> <laughs> and by and, and by and by and, and 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 by the way, there was an intervention that prevented me from uh, uh, getting being being chair of that committee because I wouldn't have gotten a security clearance, and they then required it. I want to stop this now in this chilling moment of, <laughs> before I get too nauseous. And uh, thank you very much, Bob, for this marvelous talk and conversation.